Hey, everybody. I'm Josh Welsh, president of Film Independent. Welcome to Film Independent Presents. Um, so excited to be here today to talk with Natalie Morales and Mark Duplass about their new film, Language Lessons. Um, before we get started, I want to thank a couple supporters. I want to thank Vision Media, our year-round partner on Film Independent Presents. I want to thank the HFPA, and I especially want to thank Shout Studios. Is it Shout Studios or Shout Factory for making today possible? Thank both of them. Yeah, sure. There you go. They're both. But, um, and, and thank you to Natalie and Mark for being here. It's, it's great awesome. to talk with you. Hola. I'm sorry. What, who, who are you? What are you doing in my house? Uh, Surprise! You're so dead. You are such a drama queen. I'm mad. I want you. No! You can get away. No! Who are you again? I'm your Spanish teacher. So I have to speak Spanish one day. Well, I actually bought the, uh, the the hundred lesson package. Well, did you buy me a hundred Spanish lessons? La verdad es que estoy un poco uh, perdido. I just want to make sure that you're okay. Sí. Lo siento. Adam. Yes. Adam. Yes. Stop calling me so late. It's so unprofessional. <laughs> so I have so many questions about this film um, and some other things as well. I mean, let me start off by saying, Natalie, I, like in 2021, you're coming out with, I've read articles about your directorial debut, but it's like different movies. So you have <laughs> Plan B and Language Lessons both coming out as your debut in the same year. Could you talk just the chronology of how you came to do both of these in, the, in, the, in 2021? Yeah. Um... Uh, it was uh, not on purpose that I did two movies at the same time, but it happened this way and I feel very lucky that it happened this way. Um, so I, I had been working in, in, um, on, on developing and, and pre-production basically of plan B since like 2018. And we got to like actual pre-production in February of 2020, um, you know, that very hopeful month uh, before <laughs> before the entire world shut down where we believed we could do anything. And uh, and we were like full on, full speed ahead, like sets constructed, people's hair bleached, uh, apartment rented in Syracuse, New York. And then um, the Friday before the Monday when we were going to start shooting, we got shut down because of, uh, COVID, like the whole rest of the world got shut down. And, um, and then, you know, a couple months of what the hell is this uh, in general for everybody happened. I didn't know if plan B was going to come back ever or soon or in a long, long time. And then uh, Mark uh, called me and said, do you speak Spanish? And I said, yes, <laughs> or I said, see, sí. and then, uh, <laughs> and then I, and then he gave me, he, he said, I have this idea for this movie that we could maybe do right now, like in this way, uh, in this lockdown. And I was like, okay, let's, let's figure this out. So then we made, we shot, we wrote and, and, and then shot uh, language lessons in the span of like four weeks. Um, and then while, while I was editing language lessons, um, plan B came back. And so I was shooting and editing, shooting plan B and editing and also doing reshoots for language lessons while shooting plan B. We don't do reshoots. Our movie was perfect the first time. Sure. Okay. You're right. No right. reshoots whatsoever. Uh, yeah. I was free on the weekends. Um, <laughs> I was, I was sleeping. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and then. And then uh, language lessons went to some film festivals, uh, Berlin All and, and South by Southwest, none of which we got to go to because of the pandemic. And, and, then, um, and then Plan B came out in Hulu in May. Um, so that got to the public. And then now language lessons is going to be out to the public. So there were very sort of like a DNA strand of movies uh, in that they were very intertwined and, and uh, sort of circular with each other. So that's the timeline. It's almost like you had fraternal twins who were jockeying to come out of your body first. Yes. <laughs> like you're just trying to get yes, out. Yes, yeah. And depending like if you count the foot or the head, they were, yes. they were both <laughs> okay. coming out at the same time yes. in different ways. Uh, it just happened. It's been wild. <laughs> I was just going to go with like a Taylor Swift comparison here, but I like the fraternal twin sure. model. Yes. Wow. 
Well, that's, in, I mean, that's an incredible story. Uh, and I mean, honestly, truly inspiring, like that you're able to do both of those in the midst of pretty horrific conditions. Um, when, when were you shooting, when did language lessons happen? Like what was the chunk of time where you guys were really on it? June of, of last year really was when it, I think Mark, um, Mark called me like at the end of May and then we, we got it together pretty quickly and shot it in June. Um, so not then, that far into the pandemic. That was just no, like, no, pretty early on, which is, you know, kind of what inspired it for us. And, and, and we, we definitely shot it right in lockdown. We were alone in our houses, you know. But if you had asked us back then, we would like, we've been stuck in here for so long. We need <laughs> yeah. to do something. Yeah. <laughs> now we look back and slap the shit out of ourselves. Yeah. That, but uh, yeah, that's how it felt. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark, we, um, before you called Natalie with the idea, what was your thought, what was your, the kind of seed idea for you of the project? You know, there, there wasn't too much, I'll be honest with you. You know, I was kind of in that second month of the pandemic and, and I, I was doing okay. You know, my, my wife and my two daughters, we, we had wolf packed up pretty well. We were, we were doing all the dumb things that everyone does, you know, like the, the theme dinners and watching the fun nineties movies. And we were exercising to keep our endorphins up and not kill each other. Um, and I was taking some online Spanish lessons to improve myself. Um, and what happened was, is I, I started to have these conversations with my teacher that were supposed to be conversational practice, but we were both really not into small talk and, and, you know, not to get morbid, but this was around the time that, you know, our dear friend and collaborator, Lynn Shelton had passed away. Um, and so we just started having these sort of more in-depth conversations. And I found it really interesting that um, over this supposedly limited 2D video chat device that is supposed to inhibit connection, it was actually um, helping that connection go even deeper. Um, and so that germ of the idea that this thing we're going through this and this whole video chat reduction might not be the most terrible thing in the world that we might be able to connect, um, you know, across boundaries, across languages could be something um, that doesn't make us feel like total shit. Um, so I called Natalie with nothing more than that, honestly, because I knew she, she like me has a little bit of that, um, you know, aggressive work appetite, uh, I'll, I'll say. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and she is very creatively brave, uh, like I am. She'll, she'll put on that confidence mask and with very little jump off a cliff into a project. Um, and, um, and I also, I wanted to bring it to her at an early phase because I've just been feeling lately I want to say lately, it's been more of the past five years or so, maybe even more than that, that um, the way for me to continue to make relevant and interesting art is to not develop it fully myself and then find a collaborator to help me exact my vision in the pole position seat, but to bring it to them early and to truly build it together so that I don't continue to repeat myself. But in the alchemy of the two of us, we might come up with something fresh. So when, when the two of you started the writing process together, what was, you were like in your separate uh, pods or whatever, how, how did you approach the writing and how did the, how did the story come together? We kind of did it in, in this experimental way, at least for me in this point where we, we knew we were going to play these characters and we knew there was these two characters in the movie. And so we, maybe out of like the fear of the precipice of writing a whole story, I, I, we were like, you know what, let's just, let's just go off in our separate ways and write biographies for these two characters and like who they are, what they have been through, where, where they are in life, and then come back together and see how we can collide these two people. So it, de it definitely came from a character first uh, standpoint. And then, and then we built it around that. And then, you know, we, we definitely wrote uh, actual like pages of, of script that we that we followed, especially for the parts that were mostly in Spanish. But then also it was important to us to have some scenes that were completely improvised for the most part, with the exception of, 
you know, we, we knew what we wanted to happen in a scene or rather in a lesson, you know, we, we knew the, where we wanted it to begin and end. We knew some emotional beats that we wanted to hit. We maybe knew some information we wanted to get out. Um, but it was important and sort of crucial to, to feel that like reality in the conversation and the, and the looseness of it to have it be improvised because like, you know, it, we didn't want it to feel too rehearsed or too overdone or too, uh, canned you know so uh so that 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 made the writing process quicker in that we weren't necessarily writing a lot of like dialogue we just knew emotionally and story-wise where we wanted it to go yeah i think the, the goal was basically to get enough you know of a really good um plot device in there so that it this didn't just turn into um before sunrise except they're not even walking around um, we really <laughs> wanted to be mindful that we needed to entertain audiences with uh, at least some turns. But once we had those in, in place, the, the word we kept using was, let's move with alacrity. Let's just, uh, let's just shoot this movie while we are still in love with the idea um, and hope that what we lack in preparation, we will make up for in pump and love for the project. Well, I mean, I have to say that definitely comes through in the film. It, 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 the film moves with alacrity and also the stakes are very high. I mean, the emotional stakes of what you learn through the, the story and seeing the relationship between the two of you develop is really amazing. And Thank you. I, I, I don't know if I should admit this, but when I first heard about the film, I, I, I have to say I was a little apprehensive about it. I was like, oh, a Zoom movie. So are we. It's like a <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I hope this is good. And honestly, as soon as it started, as soon as it got to the Spanish lesson, I was completely hooked. And there's something, even before you get to the emotional resonance of the story, just watching you, Mark, like navigating learning Spanish and the conversational finding the words was inherent to me, just pulled me in. And maybe it's because I have horrible high school Spanish and I was like, oh, this is like, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering things now. But, yeah. but honestly, no, it was like really engaging to see the two of you using the language lesson as a way to connect. It was like genuine, and I, I can't think of other films where I've seen that. Mm. Um, you know, people working to connect and finding the words in a way that is uh, like, it's just engaging. Um, but then as the story, I mean, to me, what's most remarkable about the film and really is, if, if anyone is watching this who hasn't seen the film, please go watch it because the relationship that you two develop within the, the Zoom platform is incredible. And it's, I mean, honestly, by the end of the movie, I was just like weeping. It's, it's a very emotionally powerful story. And um, it's surprising when we're all living on Zoom still so much and it's, it's this flat experience. Like in the context of that platform, you made something really moving and engaging. Thank and you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, we didn't, you know, I, I think I, I'm glad that we were afforded this op opportunity that was afforded to us by Mark saying, I'm going to pay for this. And if it sucks, we can bury it because <laughs> we didn't, we also didn't know if it would work or not. I mean, like I have Zoom fatigue, I, you know, I, I, I think there's, it, it's, it's, it's interesting now in that it's become such a, um, such a commonplace thing in our in our brains like i've dreamt about zoom meetings now like you know what i mean so like it, it's 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 annoying yet familiar because we're right. we're familiar with it. all of us have done this enough that that we were hoping to make something that kind of transcended the format and you were just felt like you were in the conversation with them you know because maybe you're used to seeing this format and because you're used to seeing people in these square boxes and you're and you feel like that's familiar to you that maybe the design of it would fall off and you would just be in in the story but there was a real big chance that would not work <laughs> um so i'm glad it, it seems to have worked a little yeah um before we go further, I just want to, I forgot to say at the top, anyone watching this, if you have questions, um, type them into the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen and we'll take them uh, towards the end of the conversation. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the, like even beyond the Zoom aspect, the, the film really explores intimacy in a, in a really interesting way. This idea of, I mean, this intimacy forms between the two of you, but then, Natalie, your character pushes back on that at various times or sort of says, no, I'm not your friend. And there's this, that also I found very engaging where I'm, I'm kind of like 
you know, leaning in, wanting to know, wait, where is this going to go? Is this going to blow up and fall apart? Or is the in intimacy going to deepen? And I'm just curious, I don't know if, Mark, was that in your initial thought about the story and script or those themes that you were wrestling with? Or did that come out of the conversation that you and Natalie had in developing the, the backstories? No, it was definitely, it came out of the direct collaboration with Natalie and it came out of the collision of the two characters that we wanted to play, which happened to have some nice uh, serendipitous collision points. Um, and we sort of uh, just worked with those as they, as they came together. Um, but, you know, I think that one thing that was readily apparent to us up front is that Natalie and I are just fascinated by human beings and we're students of the human condition. And um, we, we have a lot of very close platonic friends in our lives um, that, and those relationships to us are as complex, if at times even more complex than our familial relationships, you know, um, than my marriage. Um, and we give them a lot of weight. Um, and so the way that we approach this relationship was the way that we approach our own platonic relationships. And we, and by trying to put that front and center, it was almost like we didn't have to um, create the machinations for, uh, or fabricate them in any way. All we had to do was just put forward how we really feel about those uh, of those things. And it, and it kind of played out from there. And, and the only other thing I will, I will add to that, which is, you know, something I've sort of discovered about myself recently is that, you know, um, I, part of why I love making movies is it's a way for me to make a new friend and a way for me to connect with someone deeply. And Natalie was someone in my life who was in my orbit as an acquaintance that I knew fairly well, someone who worked with me on Room 104, but we never worked directly together, who, you know, I just wanted to be closer with and know really, really well. And, and in my life, I, you know, romantically, I've been married, I've been with Katie for 20 years, that stuff is all settled for me, right? So the way that I get new connections is through these like, platonic relationships where I dive in and, and have the chance to sort of fall in love platonically with people. And, and I think what you're seeing on screen, a lot of that is Natalie and I, yes, being creators and creating the story of Adam and Carino doing it, but also being aware enough to know that like, we really wanna make something together. We think there could be some magic together coming together in this moment and, and, and creating kind of a sacred space for us to come together and, and, and get that on film and hopefully uh, sort of transmit that to the audience as well. Yeah, I think that Josh, to, to, you know, you brought up a point that I that I find exciting to talk about, which is the 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 guardedness that Carino has and the like, you know, that she pushes away his intimacy and you, you find out throughout the story more specific reasons why. But something that I, I relate to that character in is that I think as a as a woman and as a and as a you know um, Latina woman, I know that people make assumptions about me and and um, and especially if and and when I was in the service industry, when I was a waiter, when I was a bartender, people people wrap their heads around what they think you are in a moment, um, and I and I kind of imbued Carino with that experience, which is like she spends her time teaching these people who don't care about her really and are like, well, look at this poor little girl in Central America. And they don't they don't think beyond that. And so she's just kind of used to playing into that and and doesn't give them, you know, the time uh, to, to dig further because she doesn't have to. And she's like, I, I just, you know, sit there for the half hour that I need to do my job and I take my money and I do what I need to do. And the second that somebody starts kind of like prodding and, and, and wondering and, and making, you know, trying to make friends with her, she's, she's guarded. And she's also like, you don't know the first thing about me. And, and, and I thought, I felt like that was really, um, interesting to play in the general, I, scope and idea of like what zoom is and what meeting people and meeting friends are where you do feel like you know something about that person you know like i i would gather that you might read a lot of books josh just by looking at your background but maybe you haven't read any of those in 20 years and maybe those are the not your books and maybe you're not at home you know what i mean like there's all these assumptions that we make about people and i thought that that was a a really 
fun part of this movie is to like slowly uh, tear those those assumptions that we make out of this little box that we're in yeah. down. And, and, and how that plays into you know, socioeconomic status and race and gender and, and even the country that you're in or whatever, you know? Um, I, I liked that part of it as well. Well, that's an amazing scene in the film where you're, you know, where you say he's not your friend, he doesn't know anything about you, he's got the white savior thing going on, like, the way, as I was watching that, I'm like, oh my God, he's so misread her. Like, she's telling the truth here. This is really, you know, he just totally misread it. And then Mark, I mean, your character's just like, no, I love you. You're my friend. I've done this myself. I know what you're doing. I do it myself. Like that back and forth was just so captivating. And like the audience does not know where it's going to go. Um, and I don't know. It's, but, but it brings me to my next question, which is how do you do that? Okay, when you're acting in a film together or in a play, the, you're there physically in the same space, you're sharing, you're playing off each other. How the, It's remarkable to me that you guys created that sense of intimacy well, I don't know what the production setup was. Were you, you were in separate rooms? Were you separate were, places, separate homes? Houses, yeah. We were yeah. never in the same house. By so were you just film filming into the void, or was were you doing it on? Like, what was the production setup? Were you actually? It was on like this. It was like Zoom, right? And then we were recording it separately as well on a webcam, but we were in a conversation, talking like this to each other. Yeah, so like this, this camera right here, yeah. <laughs> right? And we had another camera right above it that was an uh -huh. HD web camera filming it, but it allowed allowed Natalie and I to still look into this camera and have the eyeline work for the other camera above it so right. we can stay connected. So just Josh, as you really are leaning into this conversation with us and you are forgetting the Zoom format and we're engaging, we were able to do that, that same thing. And that was, that was our DP, Jeremy Mackey, really helped facilitate that for us. He created us this whole system so that it could feel like we were just there on a Zoom and of course, then he sent us a bunch of lights. He's like, you have to light yourself too. <laughs> oh shit, all right. Well, yeah, but I mean, uh, creating that, you know, you're right. Not being in the same room is 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 not the easiest uh, for for actors. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that I knew Mark enough to trust him with like, if I'm going somewhere, I know he's gonna meet me there, you know? And, and that's, if I didn't have that with Mark or if I didn't know that I would have that with Mark, it would have been much, much more difficult. I, I know this firsthand because when I was casting Plan B, we had to uh, do a, a lot of chemistry reads for the two lead roles through Zoom. And it was almost impossible to like have these two people pretend they knew, knew were best friends and have an argument over Zoom. But when people got it right, they got cast in the movie and they got it right. So like it it, it takes that sort of like uh, everybody like let's jump in and dive into this together and, and both have the same feeling about it. And, and, you know, once you like here, once I take myself off, it's just you and Mark, and then you can really just look at each other. And that really makes makes a difference. And it becomes very intimate, you sort of forget about the, you know, 65 other participants that are here, and you just kind of focus on each other. And, um, and it, it was a really interesting way to do it. And I think like, like in real life, when you have those intense FaceTime conversations with somebody that you love or, or in the last year Zoom conversations or whatever, you, human beings adapt to whatever they need to yeah. to connect. You know, we've done that through text and through phone and through FaceTime. So it's it's all part of that. The, so while the film is all, you know, told through the medium of Zoom, it's uh, one thing I another thing I liked about the film was it, it has a the film looks good. It, it, right, it has a, it's visually pleasing. The, the, however, the, the lighting, the backgrounds, the, the color palette, um, the way you broke it up, the, the stuff that you did with, where you're leaving each other messages. I mean, Mark, the, the um, Sarah, a star piece you did was- <laughs> So I mean, good, I know, I love it. a great standalone clip. Um, but a lot of the, you know, the, the segments that you did solo, um, were just lent a visual variety to the piece that where it still felt cohesive and like we're in the zoom world, but it, it made it way more visually interesting. And I don't know, was that something that you were aware of or thinking of, like we need to keep people visually engaged or? Yeah, yes, for sure. And not more than just keeping people visually engaged, it, it informs the story, you know, uh, um, 
Adam's character has a home gym and a pool and a balcony and another balcony and a bedroom and another room and a living room and a fish tank and like all of these things. And Cariño has where she teaches from, maybe her room, maybe outside, you know, like the, right. those are those are her places. So that informs these characters and their lives as well as like the things in the background. Um, something that Jeremy and I, Jeremy, our DP and I did in color is we, you know, and, and, and in post is we made sure their, their internet connections looked different. Cariños should be a little worse than, than Adams. Um, their color should be a little different. Him being in Oakland, her being in, in, um, Costa Rica. So all, all of those things, not only were we hoping would be visually interesting for the audience so that you wouldn't get bored of just looking at one thing, but there's all these little, like not not necessarily easter eggs but things going on in the background that that inform what's happening like uh for instance where cariño teaches from has a different thing in the blackboard a different situation happening every time you see her and when adam catches her on a day she's not teaching it looks totally different and is she moving out what's happening like it, it you know it, the background has a lot to do with what's happening in the story as well um, and could you talk about um, what was the role of the editor? How did how did uh, did you have a ton of footage? Did you shoot more conversations that didn't make it in, or what? I don't even remember at this point, but I'm sure we did. Our conversations certainly went longer. Um, yeah, I think our scenes all made it in the film, but there were there were some uh, side trails that yeah. Didn't make um, especially because we were improvising quite a bit of it, and 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 for the editor Aleshka Ferrero, who's incredible. Um, this is no easy feat. Like, there's nothing to cut to. It's just these two shots the whole time. And and you know, we we did use the um, the making one screen big and one screen small to hide some cuts if we needed to. Uh, but also, they were. It was important that we you know the bigger screen had you focusing where we wanted you to focus, and and vice versa. They were not only hiding cuts, but they were storytelling elements as well. Um, it's not an easy feat to make, uh, uh, but two meandering people <laughs> into a cohesive story. But uh, but it, it, I'm really happy that it worked. And, and I, you know, I think she's a big part of the reason why it did work. Yeah, she was amazing. We we she worked as an assistant editor on the morning show, uh, which is how we knew her. And um, and you know all these little movies are always just about like giving somebody their first shot to break in and she just really stepped up and took 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 the charge mm -hmm. um i i love the introduction of music to the music between the two of you the, the birthday song was just a great moment to again not just for the sake of variety but like the playfulness that that brought out and the unexpected way that you called him that night, you know, with your guitar, that like when things had sort of cut off before that, it was just a great twist. And and to see the the relationship play out through that was really, really beautiful. Thank the, you. That was the, the one least, of the funner scenes to to do. Yeah, the least planned scene in the whole movie was the Cariño drunk scene, and <laughs> and we kind of kept putting it off, saying, "Oh, we'll figure it out what we're gonna do." But secretly, I was kind of like. I think the less Natalie knows going into this, the more fun and the better it's going to be. Finally, like the night before, we came up with some little rails for it. But the like, night before, you mean the hour before? The hour before, yeah, you're right. The night of, I should say. Yeah. But all that stuff with like the, you bringing the fish in and me making up the names of the fish on but like all that was just like, whoa, whoa, what's on the happening? spot, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was it was a blast, you know. It was just a blast. The final shot of the film was a. a uh, I loved I loved the ending of the film. So I think everyone here has seen it. So no, no spoilers. But the, the final shot, the fact that it's a wide shot and that it encompasses the yard and it's not your faces up close provokes an incredible emotional reaction because you've been in this intimate up close space the entire film and then to pull back and see the way you take each other in and the way you touch your arms and everything. I mean, it's just like the most beautiful moment. It's really- Thank you. Was that, did you know you wanted to end with that wide shot kind of? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, I called, we were discussing an, an ending and I was like, I called Mark and I was like, Mark, <laughs> this is what we got to do. And we got to do it now. Like we were, we were, we knew we wanted to film the ending first for COVID safety reasons, really. Um, and, and scheduling reasons, but, but also, uh, we were like, I was like, I think this is how we have to do it. I mean, 
honestly, a shot like that is, is for me, very, very influenced by like Buster Keaton movies and silent films in general, where you, you do see this, like all of this play out in one frame. Right. But, but like you said, when you're used to seeing people in this scope, you're seeing legs for the first time, you're seeing like whole bodies, you're seeing them together for the first time. And to see her pop up in the background of something I, I, I we knew would feel so, so satisfying, you know, and, and, uh, and yeah, just letting it, letting, letting the, the camera or the computer or the phone become this other character at this point where it, it's not needed anymore. And it's just observing is, uh, was a really fun way to end the movie. And I think a really like apt way to end the movie, like it's, it's just kind of like a useless tool in the background. It no longer needed, uh, even though we've needed it the entire movie. Yeah, there's that very yes. funny little shot where Mark looks back. At, he sees you in real life, but then he looks back at the screen like yeah. to their high. Yeah, great. <laughs> we did that one a bunch of times. That was like uh, that was our only day we we got a little Fincher like where we did, shot a bunch of takes on that. One. <laughs> that Fun. One. But it was uh, it was it was emotional for both of us because you know I had, I had not hugged anyone other than my wife and my daughters and Natalie hadn't hugged anyone yeah while so that first hug was very visceral yeah. also for both of us at the time. By the way, when Mark Duplass says he got very Fincher like, he means we did like four takes. Four takes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it for me. Right? That's yeah. unprecedented. That's a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Natalie. Um, Going, I, I do want to talk uh, not about Plan B specifically, but I'd love to hear you talk just about your your interests and, and aspirations and uh, focus in terms of directing and filmmaking. I mean, I've known you as an actor for years, and it's so exciting to see you're now busting out as a as a director with not one but two films. Can you just talk a bit about like what's led you to this point? And also, the films are so different tonally and stylistically and everything. So. Which in itself is exciting, but I'm curious, like, yeah, thank you. I mean, I mean, not on purpose. They're both about friendship, which is kind of great for me. Um, they make a good double feature in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder at seeing them back to back, if you would see any similarities that I didn't intend to put in either of them that are just, you know, nascent in, in me and my work. But um, I, 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 you know, I, I have been acting for a while, but I, I directed theater and sketch for a long time um, and, and kind of didn't think I could direct movies. Like I thought that was something reserved for people that were like, I don't know, that had gone to film school or that were like white men. And so like, I just didn't, didn't ever see it as a possibility for myself. Um, and, 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 and less, you know, more because I, I was never encouraged to do it, nor was I ever, uh, did I ever see an example of someone like me doing it. And, and I, the way it really started was I was, I was auditioning for stuff that I wasn't getting that I felt like I could do really well. And so were my, my very, very talented friends who, um, you know, are all from kind of different marginalized groups and, and any roles that we were all getting were like the best friend or, or, you know, the maid or, or whatever, which are real and exist, but have reached kind of a fever pitch of too muchness as far as like, especially Latinx people are concerned. So I started writing a lot. Um, and and I was like, I, I, if I'm writing the thing, then I then I have control over the characters that are there. And then I was like, but I can't direct it. I have to, you know, I give it some. And then and then after a while, I was like, well, who's gonna direct this as well as I might? Direct? Like, who's gonna know better than me how to do these stories? So I, I decided to start building up my resume directing and I, and I directed music videos that you know for my friends bands like uh, all of my friends that are in bands I, I just like started getting practice that way and kind of doing it guerrilla all over the city and then um, I directed some bigger music videos and then I, I would call I called funny or die and like pitched stuff to them and, and did sketches for them and did some small series for them and then I I did another little web series and then and then Mark asked me to do um, an episode of Room 104, which is what got me into the Directors Guild, um, which I'm very, very thankful for. And then I ended up doing another episode of Room 104. Um, and if I hadn't done 
room 104, I wouldn't have been in contention to direct plan B, you know? Um, so it, it did open so many doors for me um, that he asked me to do that show. And, and, um, and, I, and I think only recently did I get over the um, imposter syndrome of like, I, you know, my experiences and my opinions and my thoughts and my tastes are, are just as valid as anybody else's. And I, and I never really knew that in my bones before because I had never seen it. You know, I, my way of doing things is not the same way as someone else's or maybe the same way they've been done for a hundred years, but it doesn't mean it isn't as good or better or more interesting or, you know what I mean? Just something different that we haven't seen before. And I didn't recognize until I was giving, given these opportunities that they, they might be just as worthwhile. And so, um, so that's where I'm at now, getting rid of that imposter syndrome and, and kind of, you know, learning that the way that I do things, um, might work, <laughs> which is a, which is a fun, a fun thing to learn about yourself. And I mean, like, not to minimize it, but really all directing is, is like having an opinion about everything, which I already had. I just had to keep quiet. And now I, now people have to listen to me, which is nice. Uh, so that's, that's the biggest difference in all of it. Well, I mean, I, I just want to say, I'm I, having seen your films. I'm it's, I love discovering new directors and I'm so happy that you're directing. Thank you. And, and also hearing everything you just said, I, it's also why I love independent film. And it reminds, here, just listening to you talk, I remember when I saw The Puffy Chair, when I discovered the Duplass brothers or Lynn Shelton or so many great directors who just fucking did it on their own. They, right, they, they just went out and figured out to how to get their voice up on screen. So to see you doing that is just- Thank you. Here, so Thank yeah. You. yeah. Um, well, we have a bunch of questions from the audience. So well, let me cruise through them here. Uh, the first one says, I really appreciate the film did not ignore, but took on the pandemic almost like an unseen character, unlike most films whose contexts are an escape from our current situation. Any plans to continue to create with the pandemic as a character and or setting in, the, in current or future projects? Good question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we at Duplass Brothers, we have a couple of projects that um, that were pandemic related. Um, one is a film called As of Yet from a fantastic young female filmmaker from New York um, that just played at the Tribeca Film Festival. Um, and then um, a filmmaker by the name of, of Karin Sony, who I've worked with for years, who was an actor in the movie Safety Not Guaranteed, which um, was a Spirit Award winner um, uh, with Film Independent. Um, He's been working with me for years. He got to start directing also in Room 104. Um, he and his husband just uh, co-directed their first movie that we produced for them uh, called Seven Days. Um, that's also set in the pandemic. And so we, we made a bunch during the pandemic, which was really, it was really fun to explore. That's great. Um, uh, Jonathan Schwartz says, I studied Spanish in high school and college and found the lessons presented in the film to be life affirming. And it brought back great memories from when I learned Spanish in school. Thank you for the film. And how has the film been used as a teaching tool in the pandemic and post-pandemic world? I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I think you're mature for that. So few people have seen it. So yeah, I, I, I'm glad that, I mean, that's, you know, a lot of people that uh, we've talked to about it have been like, this reminded me of taking Spanish lessons. And I was actually kind of excited to learn a little Spanish. Um, so that, that has been really fun. It's also really exciting for me to make something in Spanish because it's my first language and I've never really done anything in Spanish in my career. So I'm, I'm excited to have been able to do that. Uh, another question. The connection was so real and at times visceral. Have you known each other for a long time or was it just great writing and lucky chemistry? Hmm. <laughs> we haven't known each other for a long time. I mean, I guess it's been a few years that we've known each other kind of like a, a you know, maybe a little more than acquaintances, but, um, and maybe it's like work buddies who like kind of look across the aisle and go, no, we get each other, but never with the opportunity to like really work together or really spend a lot of time together. So this this movie, is you're, you're watching Cariño and Adam become friends as you're watching Mark and Natalie become friends, really. That's great. Um, you mentioned reshoots. What did you have to reshoot? Uh, There's a two-part question from Sean. 
What did you have to reshoot? And do you know what the fight Carino got into was about? We reshot some of the scenes um, that Carino, uh, how, how she sends Adam messages uh, solo. And, and they varied because we were, we were trying to, we were trying to inform you of her intentions without giving away too much or making it too, um, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of when you're like establishing too many details? Expository. It, too expository, right. And, and, and um, I forgot the second part of the question. What was the second part of the question? It's not in here anymore. Oh, uh, it was, um, what do we know what the fight that Carino got in was about? Oh, no, I figured it was a like a drunken fight that was really about nothing. And she just kind of has a death wish and doesn't care and, and like gets drunk at bars and is like, fucking fight me. Like she, she just doesn't doesn't. She she pushes that that life risk because it's kind of a way to feel alive for her at, at that moment in time. So it, it isn't as big of a deal to her as it is to Adam. And then he calls it out and makes a big deal about her face. And then she feels kind of self-conscious about the entire thing, you know? Also love the idea that Adam, who is pure hearted and truly loves her, thinks he's saving her from an abusive husband. And it's yeah. totally just his white savior <laughs> privilege perspective and he gets but, it wrong. But, but it doesn't by the way, that's, her. yeah, by the way, that's what media has led Adam yeah, to believe yeah. and led all of us to believe. Yeah. Like that's, that's the assumption people make when they see a battered woman. They don't think she's just like, <laughs> has a beer bottle and like smashing it at some bar, especially not the nice like Spanish teacher, you know? Okay. Yep. Yeah. A uh, question from Monique Herring, uh, who asks, I kept expecting their relationship to grow into a romantic one. And when it didn't, I appreciated that since it was the unexpected choice. Did you consider that? And if so, why did you decide against it? Thank you, Monique. Mark, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. You know, we uh, very early on, we decided we wanted this to be a platonic relationship only. Um, Part of that was because we really wanted to explore you know platonic uh relationships and in particular uh, loving platonic relationships where you really feel you know and fall for someone in the way that you do romantically but it's just platonic um and uh, i think one of the reasons that we decided to you know initially make adam's character gay was to really remove the will they or won't they romantic comedy uh potential from the table and so you would just be focusing solely on the core emotional dynamics involved and and to see if people would in, engage with that we hoped they would uh question really enjoyed your movie we need a sequel any <laughs> plans i feel like um we got really lucky making a zoom movie that's watchable um mm -hmm. natalie and i really want to work together again um but maybe we'll Maybe we'll get some film cameras this time. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's maybe it's just like uh, you know, like nest cameras inside Adam's house, watching them <laughs> coexist together. This time. Big brother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a question from Jake Lieberman: What's a language that you've always wanted to learn but never have? Mandarin. Uh, Japanese. Good. Uh, Mark, where does that ladder go? <laughs> Heaven. <laughs> um, someone asked, what's the retake story? But I think you've already answered that. Uh, yeah. um, uh, how was acting as if Zoom different from previous filming experiences? Oh, uh, the odd part is watching yourself while you're acting. You know, that's weird. Um, sometimes I would turn my camera off, but it, sometimes we had to record the screen. So that was you couldn't do that. Um, that, that was strange, but there's also something a little bit helpful about it when you're also directing it and have to see how the whole thing goes. It's kind of like doing a scene in front of a mirror where you're like, mm -hmm. can tell if you're making a weird face or not. Um, although that can be hindering to an honest performance, but, but yeah, it's, it's strange. It's a strange thing. It has its pluses and its minuses for yeah. sure. Natalie, was this your first time directing yourself? In a movie? Yes. I've done it in a play, which I don't recommend. Uh, that's really hard. <laughs> no, no one should do that. Uh, but in a movie, yes. Uh, and the last question from Melissa Levine. I loved the movie. We'd love to see a show with these wonderful characters. How did the Sarah and a star part come about? 
Um, you can answer that, Mark. You made that. You did that part. Well, we collectively decided we knew we needed Carino to give him some busy work. Um, and we thought that would be like funny if she like thought that was a good idea and then ultimately hated herself for it because she thought that was stupid. But then it actually worked. And so we said, oh, that's great. And then we said, well, what the hell is the homework going to be? And I remember early on in Spanish 101, like trying to learn the difference between ser and estar, which is the two verbs that mean to be. And it's very complicated if you're an English speaker because we just say to be and to learn what that means. And so um, I remember there was some kind of idiom about it, but I couldn't remember what the idiom was. So I just wrote this stupid Sarah a star thing and I tried to make it look like it was relating to them and I sent it to Natalie and she's like that's funny but then she crossed out a couple of things sent it back to me and and then it happened in like five minutes it was fast but it was that was really fun I was very impressed with Mark writing that I was like this, do we have to pay someone for this did you steal this from like a Spanish <laughs> lesson this is so good and he's like no I wrote it and I was like how the fuck did you write this so quickly you're like what <laughs> that's great yeah. Mark, how is your Spanish doing? Did, did you stick with the lessons through the pandemic? So I, I didn't stick with the lessons through the pandemic. I feel like the 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 movie became my lessons, you know, yeah. and, and it really did help a lot. Um, I'll tell you, we just came off of a press day today where we did live Spanish television. That'll make you nervous. Holy shit. Wow. Um, but that was fun. So, you know, it's better than it was when I started the film. My Spanish is not quite as good as Adam. So I had to practice a little more getting it in there. Um, but how, God, I mean, how lucky am I? How richly rewarding is it to decide, like, this is like a minor skill set I have. I get to brush up on it and connect with someone making this thing. It was just, it was just wonderful. It was awesome. Well, you guys, thank you so much for for talking with the the film independent crew and, and audience and um, congrats on the film. I thank really you. Love it. Everyone spread the word. Tell your friends to go watch it. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's coming out on September 10th from Shout Studios. And so is it it's getting a theatrical and online? What's the is it day and date or it's theatrical first and then there's a VOD release um, and then, you know, later on we'll find its own streaming option, but uh, the, the, select theaters first. Yeah. Actually, I have one last question. The, the artwork for it, the poster is really good and it's like original artwork. It's not a photograph. Could you talk about that? Was Did that come from Shout Studios or how did that, that come about? Yeah, um, they they have been so awesome in, in um, creating that and involving us in the in the creation, which was so cool. Um, the the positioning is not from the movie, but it but it comes from like a photo Mark and I quickly took at a photo shoot because I was like, I think we should be profiles. All right, we both got to go by. And then we just like did it very quickly. Uh, and they well, made that's never going to work. Yeah, yeah, they made this like beautiful piece of art uh, from it that you know, kind of encompasses the all, the feel of the movie in a way. Yeah, you don't have a lot of good uh, still photography when you shoot a movie on Zoom. It's not no. Like, right. It's a lot care. of just like. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you both so much. And thank you. Uh, look forward to seeing you in person someday, not too far off. Thanks. Look. Thank you, Josh. So nice to meet Did you. It. You too. Thanks Bye, everybody everyone. for coming. Thank you. Bye. Bye.